one of the keystones, uh, one, something that became a keystone of Keynesian economics, it's not in the general theory, but because there isn't a theory of the price level in the general theory, uh, something that gets incorporated into Keynesian forecasting models, and it's still there, and it was still there in the Romer Bernstein estimates that I made fun of last time, uh, is the Phillips curve. The Phillips curve is a relationship between unemployment and inflation. So if you know the unemployment rate, it enables you to predict the inflation rate or determine the inflation rate. So inflation becomes a function of slack or tightness in the labor market. Uh, this is Phillips' original curve. He doesn't have the inflation rate on the vertical axis. It's actually the rate of change of money wages, which is different, right? That's a relative price change, not a general price change. So Phillips is estimating in a world in a period in which the gold standard prevails, so the average inflation rate is basically zero. And so it's not too surprising that uh, in years of high unemployment, that's on the horizontal axis, you get low growth in wages. Right? The relative price of wages is falling or not increasing very much uh, because there's slack in the labor market. But when there's tightness in the labor market, relative price of wages uh, increases. That's picked up by Keynesians, uh, and here's an example, Samuelson and Solow, Paul Samuelson and uh, Robert Solow, in a paper in 1960, plot what they call a uh, modified Phillips curve, and there are no empirical estimates that we can discover that underlie this, where they put it. They just kind of freehanded it there. <laughs> but they were just trying to illustrate a point. All right, so at B, you've got 4.5% uh, inflation and 3% unemployment. They said, well, you can have less unemployment, but to get it, you're going to have to have more inflation. And the theory was you're going to have to pump up aggregate demand. That'll create tightness in the labor market. That'll raise wages. Rising wages will be passed through as higher prices. So they had a kind of cost push theory of inflation co uh, connected to the Phillips curve. Uh, you can have lower inflation, but if you do that, you have to restrict aggregate demand. That creates slack in the labor market. That creates unemployment. So you're going to have to tolerate higher unemployment. And in the short run, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but they were treating it as a kind of permanent feature of the landscape. Here's the trade-off policymakers face. And the wise policymaker's job is to pick the least bad combination of inflation and unemployment. And the Fed still talks this way. Right? And I say still because let's see what happened when this advice was actually taken. So here's the U.S. Phillips curve where the inflation rate, not the weight, rate of change of wages, but the inflation rate on the vertical axis and the unemployment rate on the horizontal axis for 57 to 69, and it's a pretty good fit. So it looks like there is this trade-off. If you want less unemployment, you can get it by having more inflation. And if you look at the actual dates, you can see that we were moving toward higher and higher inflation and getting less and less unemployment. So 69 is at the far northwest uh, corner. Uh, so it looked like policymakers were exploiting the Phillips curve is the phraseology that's used. But then all hell broke loose. So here's the original Phillips curve I just showed you. And here are the points for the 1970s. What happened? Right? The economy's not working the way it's supposed to, said the head of the Fed, Arthur Burns. We were told there was a negative trade-off, and now we've got higher inflation and higher unemployment. Well, if you want to be clever about it, you can estimate some new Phillips curves for the early 70s, and then 73 is the highest inflation, and then it seems to shift up again. So now the question in the economics profession was, what's making the Phillips curve shift? But this is a crisis in Keynesian forecasting models because they were using the unemployment rate to forecast inflation. That's not going to work if there are many different Phillips curves. Uh, that depends on there being a single Phillips curve. Uh, oh, so as I said, there's Arthur Burns on the far right uh, consulting with Nixon and Milton Friedman on the left, who's actually not on very good terms with Arthur Burns at that point. Uh, but Friedman and another economist named Edmund Phelps, who also got the Nobel Prize, uh, 
basically for this, for predicting that this trade-off wasn't going to be permanent. And they predicted it before it broke down, so you have to give them credit for that. Uh, they said, look, unemployment is, an, is a real phenomenon. It doesn't depend on the price level fundamentally. It depends on relative prices and it depends on people's expectations. So job searchers go out there with a wage in mind that they should hold out for. And if that wage is met by employers, they take the job. And the faster people find jobs paying the wages they were expecting to get, the lower the unemployment rate. Right? But notice the role expectations is playing in that theory. If you're not expecting enough inflation, then you're not holding out for a high enough wage. And so when you get an offer, or a salary, when you get an offer that seems good, you take it. In a sense, you didn't spend enough time searching because what you're going to be paid isn't as worth as much in real terms as you thought. You didn't estimate how much the value of the dollar was dropping. So inflation doesn't reduce unemployment once people learn that the price level is higher than it was last year. Once they adjust their wage demands, uh, once people build in expectations of inflation, then it's not enough to have inflation to get unemployment down. You have to have inflation that's higher than anticipated. You kind of have to accelerate inflation. But uh, right? So it's, it's the unexpected part of inflation that matters, not the inflation rate. There shouldn't be a stable Phillips curve. If people raise their inflation expectations, the whole Phillips curve shifts up. So that's what we saw uh, in the 70s. Only surprise inflation lowers it. Well, but that means you can't really permanently lower unemployment except by having runaway inflation. Uh, and that's not even permanent, so not really worth it. Uh, so Friedman's messages, which have pretty much been taken on board uh, by 90% of the economics profession, it's monetary policy that's responsible for inflation. You can't have sustained inflation from just cost push or markups or monopoly. Uh, it's not fiscal policy. The empirical evidence is pretty clear that there's not much of a connection between the size of the deficit and the behavior of the inflation rate. But the size of money growth and, and inflation, I'll come back to that in my next lecture, uh, that vindicates Friedman's sort of quantity theory prediction. It's the quantity of money that's governing the inflation rate. And to come back to the Great Depression, uh, Friedman made the point uh, in and Friedman and Schwartz made the point in their Monetary History of the U.S., published in 1963, that what happened in the Great Depression that prolonged it, made it so deep, was a big collapse in the money supply between 1930 and 1933. There's a series of banking panics. People are running on banks, putting money in their mattresses. The money supply is collapsing. The Fed's not doing anything to offset that. The Fed's not acting the way it should as a lender of last resort. Uh, so Friedman regards that as a, uh, not a market failure. It's a monetary policy failure. Paul Krugman has a different view, which I'll maybe come back to next time. But that's Friedman's message. Uh, 